Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello friends, welcome back to the lecture series of introduction to uh, science fiction studies. In the previous lecture, we have read about the big three authors of science fiction studies. In this lecture, we will take the discussion further and get to know some other authors of science fiction studies. They have contributed a lot, some of them more than the others, but nonetheless, these authors that we are going to discuss today have inspired a generation of science fiction authors throughout the world. Well, we have Verne, Wells, Stevenson and Huxley. These four authors, we are going to know about them and what were their contributions to the world of science fiction that will be our focus point in this lecture. We will also discuss a little bit about the themes their science fiction work covers. Now let me get a point straight right uh, at the very beginning of the lecture. That is not all the works that they write include science and technological advancement, no. But the time they refer to, the possibilities they refer to, the speculations they have in their works that is something we consider a part of the entire science fiction universe. Suppose they are referring to an alternative history, an alternative timeline. Suppose they are referring to a serum, uh, a, a serum that does not exist. They cannot tell us how that serum was made or what is the scientific formula that they have applied in order to build the serum which um, turns a man into a monster. They will not be able to tell us about the serum but they can say that yes the serum exists. So whatever the outcome, whatever the uh, purpose of the serum is that is with us but we don't know the science. Even this can be considered a science fiction because it is actually having a kind of communication with the biology, with the physics, with the chemistry of a human being. So if this is something we consider science fiction which we should, then let me tell you the domain of science fiction is very very big. So every time we take up a book and try to understand what is the technological advancement, is there any AI, is there any rockets, is there any spaceship, if it is not there then it is not a science fiction. No, that is not the case. That is what we are fighting for because these authors over there they have created an imaginative universe, whole realm of elements, fantastical elements that constitute the entire universe of science fiction. So they have become sort of pioneers in the field. Let us have a look at these authors. First we will start with Jules Verne, born on February 8th. 1828 in Nantes, France. So Jules Verne was a French writer. He was not English. Whatever he wrote, he wrote in French. And they were later translated into English. Right? He studied law in Paris but had a passion for writing literature. Although he was studying law in Paris, but still he shifted to writing literature. Published his first novel, Five Weeks in a Balloon, in 1863, which became an instant success, let me tell you. This Five Weeks in a Balloon over here, this particular idea Later on, you will see Jules Verne commenting on that idea. 
why he wrote that and how does he think about it does he think of it as a science fiction so we will take a look at that after we have gone through his life and some of his famous works most famous series of novels known as voyages extraordinaires this is a french phrase that is why it is written like that in french language uh, you write the adjective after the noun so it is roughly can be translated as extraordinary voyages this is the rough translation of voyages extraordinaries next included iconic works like journey to the center of the earth this is very famous there is a popular movie that was also directed and produced in the last maybe 5 7 years starring the rock 20000 leagues under the sea and around the world in 80 days verne was ahead of his time in envisioning future technologies such as submarines space travel helicopters so when verne was writing submarines did not exist space travel was out of the question and helicopters was also not built although i have taken his name a lot of times leonardo da vinci he gave the first design of an flying machine however he was never able to build one until the right brothers they are credited with building the flying machine that is the aeroplane okay so helicopters at that time impossible nobody could think of it when he was writing stories about these things his works inspired real world inventors and scientists like i said whatever he put down in his novels they inspired real world inventors and scientists so scientists began to wonder really if that man can imagine that man can write a story about it why not we design something like that let us try go ahead with the idea i have a very favorite saying of mine when i started reading science fiction i had this idea that everything that was previously mentioned and is now a reality is a part of science fiction so i obviously believe this fact time removes fiction out of the phrase science fiction so it is only a matter of time that we forget that it was science fiction someday we will see that it is a part of reality now okay so influencing future authors many famous writers including arthur c clark ray bradbury cited verne as a major influence on their own works in the previous lecture we discussed arthur c clark and we also said that the a b c of science fiction is asimov bradbury and clark so among these uh, authors and the big three authors that is clark asimov and heinlein all of these people were very much influenced by what jules verne had written long back they carried forward verne's legacy we will also come to that uh, what one of the authors has to say about jules verne uh, in a little uh, moment so everybody was indebted i n d e b t e d indebted to the works of jules verne uh, this is a list of the famous science fiction composed by jules verne journey to the center of the earth which was published in 1864 The story follows Professor Otto Leidenbrock, his nephew Axel, and their guide Hans, 
as they embark on a daring expedition to the Earth's core through an extinct volcano. So, the time Jules Verne was writing this, the idea about Earth was there and there was also the knowledge in the human domain that there is a core of the Earth which is full of magma, which is hot and boiling and everything. So, this particular author, Jules Verne, he goes and writes a story about how a professor, his nephew and their guide go deep into the earth and find its core and discover prehistoric time eras, prehistoric animals, landscape. This is fantastical, but even then, nobody can imagine that kind of experimentation of going into the hottest part of the earth that is the earth's core. 20,000 the next work that we are going to discuss is 20,000 leagues under the sea. Now one of the aspects of science fiction is experimenting with the environment. So in the first work we see that the professor is going into the core of the earth. In the second work, we will see that the characters are going 20,000 leagues. Leagues is a um, metrical unit. It is a unit that uh, measures distance. Here, the characters will be going down below into the ocean 20,000 leagues below the uh, water level, below the surface level. Captain Nemo and his enigmatic submarine the Nautilus. Nautilus is the name of the submarine which is commandeered by Captain Nemo. Take readers on a deep sea adventure exploring the wonders and mysteries of the ocean. So, in this part we are exploring the depths of the ocean. In the other novel we were exploring the depths of the planet earth. The third one in line is a description of the novel from the earth to the moon published in 1865 let me tell you this is again based on the popularity of the works not chronological the most popular is journey to the center of the earth second is 20,000 leagues under the sea the third one is from the earth to the moon a visionary tale that follows the Baltimore gun clubs ambitious plan to launch a manned mission to the moon using a massive space cannon. So, at that time, there was no concept of rockets. What instead Verne suggested was a space cannon. Space cannon means you will be installing a cannon in which people will be put and the uh, pod or the spacecraft, small spacecraft carrying the people will be put inside the cannon, then the cannon will be fired and the spacecraft will go. So, that time the idea of propulsion, that time the idea of lifting up of the rockets for, by ignition of fuel, uh, these things were not over there. Now we have ro rocket launching centers all over the world. Uh, one is there in India at Sri Harikota. All the launches of Chandrayaan and uh, other uh, probes that we have sent to the space, everything has been launched from Sri Harikota. So, that time they did not have the idea of a launch site, but they had thought of an idea of a space cannon which can throw a spacecraft, which can shoot a spacecraft in a particular direction. So, the fourth one in this row is around the world in 80 days. Personally, this is one of my favorite novels because here it is not directly referring to a science fiction, but it is talking about the change of time as we go around the world. See, very easy to understand when the world is moving on a particular axis, isn't it? This is the earth and it is moving like this. This is this circular motion and it is moving. It is called the rotation of the earth. And if a person moves 
from this side to that side on the planet what will happen to his timeline instead of losing a day he will be gaining a day so that is very fantastic uh, concept which has been um, introduced in this particular uh, novel if you go through the novel you will find it is a novel full of twists and turns a thrilling experience about the person who goes around the world in 80 days it is a bet actually though not strictly science fiction this adventure novel features phileas fogg's attempt to circumnavigate the globe in 80 days involving innovative transportation and technological advances of the time there is the mention of steam engine there is the mention of other uh, transport mechanisms and all begins with a bet that phileas fog plays that phileas fog places in front of the club members that i can i have calculated that i can travel the world in 80 days his club member says no it is impossible you cannot travel the world in 80 days because there will be natural disasters there will be human artificial disasters everything can impede your journey everything can be an obstacle in your journey you cannot say that uh, everything counted you can travel the world in 80 days but phileas fox says i can and i will just watch me so he goes and uh, plays on uh, through the entire novel trying to win the bet the mysterious island 1874 a group of castaways castaways means those who have been exiled from the society a group of castaways uses their ingenuity that is intelligence to survive on a seemingly deserted island uncovering its mysteries and discovering hidden treasures so this is also an adventure related story not much of a science fiction but yes there are lot of mysterious happenings which are natural or phenomenal but they are in the domain of speculative fiction as you see the list goes on robert the conqueror 1886 a tale of a brilliant inventor robert and his futuristic aircraft the albatross albatross is the name of his aircraft so in this one we find the mention of an aircraft or a flying machine which he uses to challenge the world's best scientists and claim dominance over the skies this can also be read as a social commentary that if i have the power to dominate a particular area then it is quite natural that i will claim this area to be mine so once this particular person robber he designs the aircraft he goes and challenges all the scientists and inventors of the world that since i have designed the aircraft the air space is mine the begum's fortune 1879 in this work verne explores the idea of a utopian city called villa emily built with advanced technology and innovative social systems so in this novel the begum's fortune you will find mention of advanced technologies which were not there in that day but some of which are there today in our daily lives and innovative social systems social system means the way a person carries oneself in the society there is a hierarchy in our society in that society that hierarchy is different the purchase of the north pole 1889 also known as topsy turvy the novel presents an ambitious plan to shift the earth's axis by purchasing the north pole and using heavy artillery can you imagine consider purchasing mount everest can we go and i outright say to the world governments to the country's governments that i want to purchase mount everest that is not a property that cannot belong to a particular person it can be within the geographical boundary 
of a particular state or a country but never belong to a particular person. But in this novel, we are seeing privatization of natural uh, resources, natural um, formations. Can you buy a river? Can you buy an ocean? No, but we in our world have seen that a person can buy an island. Island can belong to a person. So slowly, as the people get rich, someday they will be buying countries. Rest assured about that. So the novel presents an ambitious plan. So this person goes to buy North Pole. That I am going to buy the North Pole of the exact point of North Pole of the Earth. And after that, I am going to use some machines and try to shift the North Pole from where it is to a different part. So that is called terraforming. Let me tell you. Terra forming. It means reformation of the entire planet. The next one in this row is the clipper of the clouds, 1887. The story revolves around the invention of a giant airship. See, so the first time we mentioned aircraft is in this particular story that is Robert the Conqueror. The second time we come here, the clipper of the clouds, the one who cuts through the clouds. The story revolves around the invention of a giant airship, Albatross 2. So here we had Albatross and here we are having Albatross 2. Let me tell you, Albatross is actually the name of a bird, which is an oceanic bird. It flies over the seas. It is seen mostly near the seas, big water bodies. Capable of carrying passengers on high speed transatlantic flights. So Atlantic is the name of the ocean, Atlantic Ocean. And transatlantic means across the Atlantic Ocean. So Albatros is that giant airship, that giant aircraft, which is able to carry passengers within itself and can carry them from one part of Atlantic Ocean to the other side of Atlantic Ocean. Facing the flag, 1896, an adventure that centers on the invention of an immensely powerful weapon, the Fulgurator, which poses a threat to global security. So here we find that science and technology creating weapons. This is as old as it gets. Whenever there is scientific developments in a society, people tend to use it to attack other areas, try to get more property. When the gunpowder was used, dynamite was used, people used it to blow up other places or to create mines and uh, uh, go deep into the earth to get the iron ore. That is the positive thing. But suppose you are using dynamite to destroy a country. That is the weaponization of dynamite. I will tell you the story in a, some short time. Now let us go and take a look at Vern and science fiction. What is their relationship really? Did Vern initially think about writing science fiction? Where did the thought come from? Just let us have a look at this quotation from Jules Verne himself. When he was asked about the story of five weeks in a balloon, this was his response. I wrote five weeks in a balloon. This is the novel. Balloon means it's not a, your regular balloon. Balloon here means a particular structure which carries passengers, something like this. I'm sure you have seen structures like this. This is filled with hot air so that it rises up from the ground. It will rise up and it will have a very big kind of canopy. It will rise up and it, will, it can be steered from one place to another. And the people will be sitting on this particular place. So instead of this, he considered it a complete spaceship kind of thing. 
and this hot air balloon was his first idea of a flying machine. Or a flying aircraft. Right? So this entire structure that he imagined, was it just because of experimenting with the field of science fiction? I wrote this particular novel not as a story about ballooning, that is traveling via balloon, but as a story about Africa. I always was greatly interested in geography, history and travel. And I wanted to give a romantic description of Africa. Now there was no means of taking my travelers through Africa otherwise than in a balloon. And that is why a balloon is introduced. I may say that at the time I wrote the novel as now, I had no faith in the possibility of ever steering balloons. This particular line is actually his claim that I never thought to be a balloon pilot. I don't even know if that kind of balloon can be steered that is uh, sent in one particular direction. Steering, car steering, you understand, I'm sure all of us are familiar with the word steer. So when he was writing five weeks in a balloon, Jules Verne did not himself believe in the idea that a balloon can be steered from one place to another. Because what we understand it is like a gas, hydrogen or helium gas and we uh, give small balloons to children and it is for entertainment. But a balloon if used to carry passengers from one place to the other, it is another completely different uh, area of scientific development that we are talking about. But Jules Verne did not have any faith in that kind of thing. Yet, he wrote a story about it. So who knows, maybe the author had faith in it, did not have faith in it, but these are the words he says. That the science fiction part is not the important part. The important part is a viewpoint from a top height, viewpoint from where you can see the African continent. So that is the uh, frame of reference that Jules Verne wanted to create in his novel. Then we have Ray Bradbury. I'm sure you remember Ray Bradbury from A, B, C of science fiction. A for uh, Asimov, B for Bradbury and C for uh, Clark. So this particular B, Ray Bradbury, he commented uh, one of his interviews that we are all in one way or another the children of Jules Verne. So what ideas, the ideas that Jules Verne gave, we carried them forward. We began to become the legacy that Jules Verne has left behind. He had given ideas about traveling to the center of the earth, traveling to the deep sea, traveling to moon. All the travel narratives that he has created, we have all just breathed some science into it. We have just tried to create the scientific explanations that can carry forward the narratives of Jules Verne. So that, that way, we are all children of Jules Verne. Now we move on to a different author, H. G. Wells. Well, Wells is famous for his utopia. We have a separate lecture uh, of uh, utopia and uh, dystopia, uh, both separate lectures. You will find more about this word in those lectures. But he has written famously about societies, thought about societies which are futuristic, which are good which create a kind of atmosphere around us that can be a possibility in the future. That is what H.G. Wells says. So they are called as Wellsian Utopia. So the full name of H.G. Wells, although he is famous worldwide as H.G. Wells, but it is good to know the full name really, Herbert George Wells. Born on September 21, 1866 in Bromley, Kent, England. 
raised by working class parents his childhood was marked by poverty and ill health so not every author has a fairy tale kind of a uh, life not every author is uh, actually in fact literature comes from places where there is suffering because when there is suffering when there is ordeals when there is struggle a person starts to speculate starts to meditate starts to reflect on the situation philosophize it metaphorize it and present it to other people so hg wells came from a background of poverty and ill health he pursued a teaching career but he soon shifted to writing so originally he wanted to be a teacher but then again he found out that he is better off as a writer wrote utopian and speculative fiction envisioning a better future for humanity so like i mentioned before wells is famous for his utopia and the vision he had for the future the shape of things to come presented a long term vision of world peace and global governance so this is again wishful thinking we call this a wishful thinking that some day the entire world will have peace no country will be fighting with any other country and the government of the world will be one there will be a centralized system of governance and every country will be happy with that that is his vision for the future this is a list of famous science fiction works by hg wells the number one work who about which everybody talks that is the time machine published in 1895 popularized the concept of time travel the protagonist known as the time traveler journeys into the distant future and witnesses the evolutionary divergence of humanity we have seen that humanity right now is under threat of casteism class distinction there is higher class lower class middle class everywhere there is this kind of dichotomy this kind of hierarchy what hg wells goes and thinks about is a society where there are distinction based on the way humans have developed way humans have evolved they have evolved into two different kind of species that is what the time machine is about but the very interesting science fiction aspect of this particular novel is that there is the mention of time machine a machine which can convey one person from the present to the future or can bring somebody from the future to the present the war of the worlds martian invasion on earth so these aliens the inhabitants of mars they come to earth and they try to kill everybody imaginative portrayal of extraterrestrial beings and advanced technology explores themes of imperialism human resilience and the vulnerability of mankind against superior forces till this time we of all the creatures on this planet we think ourselves to be the most superior creature ever suppose there is a life on this solar system or in this galaxy which is more superior than us they have advanced technology they have advanced machinery of weapons of mass destruction what then will we be able to sustain ourselves so here wells questions the superiority of human beings wells tries to question is it really us that as the that is the most superior being on the solar system it makes us question our place our identity as human beings so it is also a very good read number 3 the invisible man 1897 a scientist named griffin discovers a way to become invisible as he grapples with the consequences of his new found power griffin's descent into madness is explored in this gripping tale let me tell you there is also a movie based on the story that is 
the hollow man you can have a look at that it is a very famous movie i think it was released almost 20 years back i was a kid when this movie was released and it is exactly the same thing a scientist tries to um inject himself with a serum which turns him into an invisible being and with his new new found powers he goes and does things which he is not supposed to do so this raises another question is invisibility a boon or a ban next is the island of dr morio shipwrecked on an isolated island edward pendick encounters dr morio who conducts bizarre experiments on animals turning them into human like creatures so again there is a science fiction a very strong science fiction element that is the element of genetic engineering one thing we have already cleared and i will write, like to reiterate at this instant is that he may not he by he i mean ag wells may not be able to tell you what is the process of the experiment how is he doing that but the possibility is what makes this novel a science fiction the possibility that a that an animal can be changed into a human like creature that is the element of science fiction in this story moving forward the first men in the moon 1901 two explorers bedford and caver journey to the moon using a substance called cavorite on the moon they encounter a race of insect like creatures known as the selenites so this is another story completely different they go to the moon with the help of a substance called cavorite and in the moon they encounter lunar inhabitants the war in the air published in 1908 devastating consequences of aerial warfare a global conflict driven by advancements in aviation aviation means flying technologies aviation technology reflecting wells's concern about the dangers of militarization flying is okay but nowadays we have fighter planes we have planes which can actually shoot missiles from one place to another so with the advancement of technology we are also seeing that the technology that we are developing for the betterment of human kind for the upliftment of the quality of life of human kind that same technology is being used to weaponize uh, a previously uh, outdated technologies the the air space which is actually can be a means of fast travel for the human beings that air space is being weaponized that is the war in the air the shape of things we have already discussed it is a utopia kind of thing presents a long term vision of the future including world wars and global governments that there is peace and all the governments have grouped together to form one centralized power of the global governance the food of the gods and how it came to earth published in 1904 the ramifications of a scientific discovery that accelerates the growth of living organisms the food of the gods causes unintended consequences when applied to plants animals and humans this is an idea which has been taken directly into the movie uh, captain america i'm sure you have heard of this particular movie and this character is very famous if not just google it captain america is that kind of scientific experiment that he is given a medicine he is given a treatment and then he rises up 100 years after initially he is frozen and then uh, it is again a sleeper wake kind of novel uh, you remember uh, we will discuss all of these things in uh, utopia and dystopia lectures so here we see again there is a mention of something some kind of genetic engineering that the dna has been altered there has been a different kind of medication given to the patient so the patient's growth the organism's growth has increased that is overnight uh, if a baby is born overnight the baby will grow to a fully 
functioning human being not mentally but physically this is the third author that we are going to deal with that is r l stevenson he is not a very popular author of science fiction but he is a very popular author in himself born in november 13 1840 in edinburgh scotland so is a scottish author into a family of lighthouse engineers so he was born into a family which had already a history of engineering history of science history of technology father and grandfather were renowned lighthouse designers and engineers if you are not familiar with the word lighthouse let me tell you lighthouse is a kind of structure which is built near the sea ports so that at night the lighthouse can guide the ships traveling in the distance guide them safely to the shore because it is not possible to light up the entire sea to put uh, sea lamps it is not possible so the captain sees the lighthouse from far and is able to uh, safely direct steer his ship from deeper waters to shallower waters and hit the port attended the university of edinburgh to study engineering but focused more on literature and composition so initially like his father and grandfather he was also sent to study engineering so all the people seeing the video right now if you have faced this kind of parental pressure that no you have to study engineering there is no future in arts let me tell you something Uh, R L Stevenson would not have become R L Stevenson had he pursued engineering focused more on literature and composition became a bohemian and declared himself an atheist so the parental pressure at his home was so much so that he revolted outright during that time there was no fashion of keeping your hair long but he started keeping his hair long and wearing very funny kind of dresses according to that fashion he outright went and declared in front of his christian family that i don't believe in god can you imagine the strength that a person requires to say something like that in front of his family members and then also stevenson writes a letter to his friend i have been uh, very successful at uh, disappointing the two people in my life who cared about me so much i have given up on their happiness and i have successfully done that the two people meaning his parents most famous works include treasure island kidnapped and the strange case of dr jekyll and mr hyde influenced several literary works of joseph conrad because his literary works were mostly related to the sea there were lots of description of islands and voyages voyages means traveling through the sea and sea issues sea related issues if you are out on the sea there will be certain issues so those things he had described so wonderfully in his novels that joseph conrad who uses sea very much in his novels actually followed him and his information went on to build many of joseph conrad's work this is the most famous work of science fiction by r l stevenson and perhaps one in only two three works other all of his works are adventure works you can have and go and look at it so this particular novel the strange case of dr jekyll Uh, and mr hyde while primarily categorized as a horror novella this iconic work can be considered proto science fiction that is before the science fiction originally existed this was the idea of what science fiction would be due to its exploration of dual personalities and a scientific experimentation the story revolves around dr henry jekyll who creates a potion to unleash his dark side transforming him into the sinister edward hyde so there are two personalities
and one person. So inside that one person, there are two personalities. I'm sure all of you have uh, known because you are living in India, uh, you must have heard of the famous Bollywood movie um, Bhul Bhulaiya, right? So in that movie, you see the character of Avni. She has split personalities. Once she is our dearly beloved Avni who has recently come from outside and uh, staying in the novel. And at night, she completely changes her personality and becomes uh, a person who she sees in the pictures only and gets to know about her like that. That is Manjulika. Everybody uh, has nowadays memes about Avni and Manjulika. But this is actually a derivation uh, from the original uh, story, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where two personalities were seen to reside within one body. So it is not only a science fiction kind of novel, but it also talks about the psychological perception. The entire vista of psychology was immediately called into action when this novel was being written. Aldous Huxley. Now let us consider about uh, one of the most um, influential science fiction writers. Although he did not write many science fiction works, but one of his work is so famous that nobody can discuss dystopia without discussing Huxley. Born on July 26, 1894 in Godalming, Surrey, England, to a family of prominent intellectuals. So Huxley had already intellectual background, attended Eton College, later studied English Literature at Balliol College, Oxford. So he is one of the university wits, if we can call them like that now. At 16, contracted an eye disease left him nearly blind for several years. Despite his visual impairment, he continued to read and write with the aid of magnifying glasses. Can you imagine the devotion a child, a teenager, a 16-year-old boy has? He is reading through magnifying glasses because he is almost blind. He is writing with the help of magnifying glasses. So that kind of devotion you find in Aldous Huxley. Brave New World. This is the most famous work of Huxley, published in 1932. A dystopian novel depicted a future society controlled by technology and a totalitarian government exploring themes of conformity and loss of individuality. We have a separate lecture on dystopia and I have discussed this novel very in a very detailed manner. So you can just go to that lecture and watch it. You need not worry. This is one of the most important foundation stone of dystopian literature. But Huxley did not only wanted to paint a very sad picture of the uh, future world. He also wrote something called The Island, a utopian novel presenting a vision of an ideal society based on spiritual and psychological principles. So one time Huxley believed that the future is going to be so bleak, so bad, the society is going to disintegrate, there will be artificial production of babies, there will be genetic engineering, people will no longer be the same, the humanity that we are experiencing right now will drain away from our society. After writing all of these things, Huxley felt that he has gone too far. Now, in order to create a balance, he needed to write something which is, which is a positive view of the future. So he went and wrote The Island in 1962. It talks about ideal society based on spiritual and psychological principles. So there the value is given to the spirit of a person, to the ethics and values that is inculcated in a human being. Next, he was very much interested in psychedelic experiences in 1950s, became interested in psychedelic substances, particularly mescaline and LSD, experimented with these substances and documented his experience in the book 
the doors of perception written in 1954 these are all this mescaline and lsd these are addictive drugs but thank god huxley was not an addict if anything but an addict he experimented with these drugs and he wanted to write something about the experiences so that is what he did when he went and wrote literature the doors of perception he actually documented what are the things that he was experiencing while he was having the effects of these drugs on his body and mind associated with prominent writers like t s eliot and george orwell t s eliot is a nobel prize winning uh, writer he has contributed to the entire movement of modernism right from 1922 the publication of the wasteland if you are interested in reading t s eliot you can just go and google 20th century literature you will find him right there and george orwell we also have orwell's 1984 as a part of the dystopian literature uh, lecture so you can read the details of george orwell there other notable works included point counterpoint and the perennial philosophy these are some famous works by aldous huxley brave new world we have discussed this again but we will talk about the genetic engineering psychological manipulation a society dominated by consumerism and mass entertainment there you will also find that the society that has been created is very much manipulated the people who are going to work they are actually working throughout the day and getting addicted to drugs and other uh, alcoholic substances throughout the night so they don't really have any problem with the government because they don't have any time for critical thinking next he writes brave new world revisited in 1958 this non-fiction work this is not a fiction work let me tell you it is a kind of an essay a non-fiction work serves as a follow-up to brave new world and re-examine re-examines its predictions and themes in light of the evolving world so in this essay Huxley goes and tries to compare that we have discussed brave new world, the society, the system there. But is it a part of our reality? Is it a part of our reality now? That is something which he discusses, compares, contrasts, contradicts in this particular non-fiction work. After many a summer dies this swan, 1939, delves into the themes of immortality the pursuit of eternal youth and the consequences of trying to escape death we all have this tendency we like to feel that we are always we are going to live forever this is our belief we want to believe that and we will always remain young so youth forever and life forever these are the two things human being aim for throughout their life but we know that is not true so that possibility, the possibility of extending the life of human beings, the possibility of extending the youth of human beings has been explored in this particular work. Ape and Essence, 1948, set in a post-apocalyptic world, satirizes human behavior, potential consequences of unchecked scientific advancements. So if there is a scientific advancement and it is unchecked, that means we have we have designed the machine to harvest the power of the nucleus of an atom but what have we done with it have we powered um, plants have we powered the cities the villages no we have made bombs bombs to destroy cities and destroy other uh, people's lives and homes this is an example of unchecked uh, scientific advancements there is no check on that no but yes all the governments of the world they have come to a consensus that we are not going to use nuclear warfare or nuclear bombs because if we do that the entire world will go existence this is the check that the government is putting on this kind of technology island 1962 we have already discussed this a utopian society remote island that seeks to balance spiritual ecological that is related to the environment psychological elements 
This is a list of reference books that we have. Jules Verne at Home, Ray Bradbury, Introduction, Smith John, The Dystopian Vision of Aldous Huxley, Webb Barners, The Science Fiction of Aldous Huxley, Science and Technology and the Art of Robert Louis Stevenson, and my favorite, David Seed, Science Fiction, A Very Short Introduction. All of these references will help you to understand whatever the topics that we have been discussing today, the four authors, Jules Verne, um, Aldous Huxley, H.G. Wells and R.L. Stevenson. All these four authors have contributed to the basic ideas of science fiction. Whenever you consider an idea of split personality, you will be remembering R.L. Stevenson. Whenever you consider the idea of a very bad kind of society where human beings are going to suffer, you will remember Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Whenever you come across a science fiction work, a, a, a novel, a story, a movie where people are traveling from one place to the other, from one galaxy to the other, from Earth to the Moon, from the Mars to Earth, you will remember H.G. Wells because he has experimented so much with this entire travel thing and also Jules Verne. The idea of traveling deep inside the earth, the idea of traveling deep inside the uh, ocean, going and finding fantastical creatures over there. Every time you watch a movie, you will remember these authors because their contribution has been primary in the field of science fiction. Now it is time to take hold of the references and go forward, have a look at the questions. Do you think you can answer this question after this lecture series? Let us have a look at the questions first. What are the major contributions of R. L. Stevenson to the field of science fiction? Just have to go back to the slides, you look up the works that we have discussed about R. L. Stevenson and his being coming from an engineering background, just look at the uh, engineering aspects in his novels, you can understand what are his contributions, how he is placing a kind of uh, idea into the mind of millions who are going to write science fiction after him. Who is Aldous Huxley? Write a brief note on his view of the future world order. So in order to write this answer, you will have to first about, talk about the you will have to first talk about the negative view that he has painted in Brave New World and then the positive view he has painted in the island. This is the story. These are the two things that you have to discuss. In which language did Jules Verne write? I am telling you the answer. French. He wrote in French because he was from France and then his works were translated into English. But here is the thing, the earlier translations of Jules Verne were so pathetic that the translators themselves tried to take uh, credit, they added their own ideas, they omitted some of the ideas, deleted some of the ideas of Jules Verne and the uh, translation was also not very accurate. So nowadays there has been a lot of better translations of Jules Verne, have a look at that. Mention some science fiction ideas that he gives in his novels. Why do you think the science fiction authors keep cautioning us with the tales of bad consequences of technological advancements? Now this is a kind of metacognitive question. Your entire understanding of the domain of science fiction needs to be called into question in order to answer this particular interrogation. Discuss the split personality tales by H. E. Wells. So there is a tale of split personality, right? That two personalities residing in one body. Discuss about it. Can you explain this phenomenon by the use of modern psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis is a term which is uh, very recent, only after Sigmund Freud had come up with this technique that in order to cure the psychological problems of a patient, you don't need to uh, electrocute that patient, you don't need to hammer the head of the patient. All you need to do is counsel him, counsel him, 
talk to him or her properly. So that is the newest kind of uh, technique of treating mental diseases, not the ones which are actually uh, diseases of the body, but diseases of the mind are treatable through counseling. What is your response to Ray Bradbury's opinion? We are all in one way or another the children of Jules Verne. So we have discussed this particular sentence in one of the slides related to Jules Verne and science fiction. You can just go and have a, a second hearing of that particular presentation. Last but not the least, we have discussed in details any movie adaptations you have come across of the tales told by Verne, Wells, Stevenson and Huxley. I'm sure all the ideas that we have discussed here today are not new. There are multiple uh, Avengers movie, multiple Marvel Universe movies, DC Comics movies. Everywhere you will find the motives of time travel, space travel, psychological problems, uh, the travel into the uh, deep sea uh, stories. Everywhere you will find reflections of these kind of science fiction elements and plots. So just go and have a look at the entire genre of Bollywood and Hollywood and try to see where these ideas have been adapted to form a special tale. These things, if you are able to answer, then you will be uh, immortalizing these four authors in your mind forever. Thank you for watching this lecture. I hope that we have gathered a lot of information to move forward. We will also come across some Indian authors, women and non-binary non authors of science fiction separately so that we will have now an idea of the basics of science fiction, the basic ideas of science fiction, the earlier writers of science fiction. Only then we will be moving on to movies, video games and other platforms. I'm sure you will be enjoying through those episodes. Thank you again. Thank you once again for watching. See you in the next lecture.